Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second day of the Road to um, Warsaw Security Forum Western Balkans program. I hope you're all well rested after our e-workshop yesterday on disinformation and ready for a new day of exchanges with our experts. So the title of our session is Cooperating with the EU on Major Security Challenges. And it is my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Cott, the Deputy Program Director of the Warsaw Security Forum. He will be uh, moderating the, today's session. Uh, Bart, you have the floor. Thank you, Daria. Um, everyone can hear me? Yes, that's perfect, superb. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the panel discussion entitled Cooperating with the European Union on Major Security Challenges as a part of the Western Balkans program within the framework of the Warsaw Security Forum. My name is Bartomi Kot, and today I'm, I'm moderating a surely interesting and engaging discussion with our distinguished guests, uh, Roland Freudenstein and Vuki Remic. Mr. Freudenstein, you can see him somewhere in the chat box here, uh, is a frequent speaker of Warsaw Security Forum events, uh, policy director of the Wilfred Martins Center for European Studies, the think tank of the European People's Party in Brussels. Uh, Roland is known all over the think tank community as an advocate of the US and democracy and a critic of the Russian and Chinese and democratic activities. But first of all, the specialist on European integration and international security. Mr. Yeramich, also somewhere here in the chat box, uh, currently president of the Center for International Relations and Sustainable Development and the leader of Serbia's People's Party, was Minister of Foreign Affairs of Serbia from 2007 to 2012 and subsequently the president of the United Nations General Assembly. Young global leader of World Economic Forum in Davos, Mr. Jeremic is among other things known for his actions uh, for establishment of the post-2015 Sustainable Development Agenda as well as facilitation of the Arms Trade Treaty. Good morning, gentlemen. My pleasure to host you here today. But before we jump into discussion, uh, allow me please to briefly explain to our participants the plan for today's panel. So firstly, we'll listen to the discussion between our guests um, on the topic. And later on, I book at least 30 minutes uh, of our meeting for direct questions from the audience. I strongly encourage you now, and I will be repeating myself probably during the discussion, please engage. Uh, please use the chat box for this purpose. I have it somewhere here as well. And type in your questions as, uh, as they come to your minds while we speak, and uh, I will make sure that you will have space to ask them directly to our guests uh, at the end of our discussion. And gentlemen, um, as the rule to both of you, I expect you both to engage in direct conversation also between each other. Uh, therefore, I will allow uh, any at bottom, uh, if you want to directly refer to your friend from the other Zoom chat box. Uh, okay, uh, we know the rules, so off we go. Um, it is hard for the moderator to start the discussion on the Western Balkans while talking directly to the audience that comes uh, from the region. Uh, but I want you to recall a set of uh, events that are shaping the European Union Western Balkans relations now and can have an impact on what currently our cooperation looks like. So let's recall a long process of the European Union enlargement policies in the region halted among uh, others by Macron's call to revise the future of enlargement. Let's recall a recent Chinese advance in the region underlined by the mask diplomacy during the first blow of COVID. Let's recall a long-standing Serbia-Kosovo conflict with its very recent US mediation and a possible Trump lake somewhere uh, on our future maps. And finally, let's recall Serbia's strong cultural and political ties with Russia and the advance of the latter in Montenegro and or North Macedonia. So that's what my imagination brings to my mind. Um, gentlemen, now let's test your imagination. What are the most pressing, interesting, concerning security issues to the mutual cooperation of the European Union and the Western Balkans? Mr. Jeremic, please go ahead. 
Thank you very much for this kind introduction and thank you everybody for, for inviting me, for agreeing to bear with me for, uh, for some hour and a half with, with the rest of the crowd. Thanks to the uh, uh, Kasimir Pulaski Foundation and the Warsaw Security Forum. It's been a great pleasure to attend the Warsaw Security Forum over the past years. Uh, and special thanks to uh, my friend uh, Kasia Pesarska the most amazing professional, one of the most amazing professionals that I've met in my line of work over the past decade. I don't know if she's with us on this Zoom, but uh, she's the chief responsible for having me uh, with you uh, this morning. So if, if anything goes wrong, then all the, uh, all the complaints should go to Kasia. Um, yeah, Western Balkans and Balkans in general, uh, place with uh, abundance of history, lots of history, and uh, nothing is ever forgotten and nothing is ever forgiven. This history tends to be interpreted and internalized in vastly different ways across the region, but uh, lies very much at the heart of uh, current problems and uh, not that, not just problems of the Balkans, but problems of the wider European family uh current situation to describe some of the key points uh brought with regard to the current developments it's very difficult to analyze the situation anywhere in the world outside the context of the pandemic this crisis has profoundly changed uh our world our relations and how how economies conducted how politics is conducted it exacerbated certain trends that have been in existence uh, for the past years. Uh, it has accelerated things in the geopolitical realm and the geoeconomic realm to the points of extreme, both in positive and negative ways. But I'll try for the sake of this conversation uh, to look uh, somewhat narrowly to the Western Balkans and, and I'll actually try to begin by answering your question, what is the single biggest concern? I think that the single biggest concern is to do with uh, uh, dramatic deficit in democratic government, and in particular in the, in the biggest country of the Western Balkans, which is Serbia, Serbia being the biggest. Uh, if good things happen in Serbia, there are tends to be a very positive spillover effect. If negative things happen in Serbia, ditto, uh, very, very negative spillover effect. Uh, if you look at the map, I mean, you are offering the Balkans, so I don't really have to go from first principles, but uh, the Western Balkans is, is a island in the sea of the European Union and somewhat different from Switzerland, which is also an island and you know, bringing in to the table, uh, to the European table, I'd say far more problems right now than, than solutions, including to the security questions. But I think that the strategic answer to the security cooperation between Europe and the Balkans, the only real strategic long-term answer is, is integration. It's very difficult to argue for anything uh, other than integration, given the geography, given the culture and the history uh, of the region. And I'm not going to get right now, perhaps there are going to be questions down the road uh, to do with the specifics of the integration process. But if the strategic goal is to integrate the Western Balkans into the European family of nations, then I am afraid that we are on a vastly uh, wrong track we are moving and uh, my opinion is galloping, as a matter of fact, in the wrong direction. If our goal is to get the Balkans integrated into the European Union. And uh, at least when it comes to Serbia, the answer is very simple. Uh, Serbia is no longer a democracy. And I'm just, just giving a uh, uh, arbitrary personal subjective statement I'm referring to the uh, reports of various uh, independent bodies. Of course, the European Commission is producing uh, accession 
report regularly. It's very detailed, very bureaucratic, very diplomatic. Uh, so I point to some other uh, analysis uh, by respected uh, independent bodies like uh, the Freedom House, uh, famous Freedom House of uh, Washington that makes its annual assessment of the state of freedom and democracy around the world. And uh, these days it categorizes Serbia as a hybrid regime. Uh, it's no longer uh, belonging to the category of free states. We are unfortunately just partly free right now and we're no longer dem a democracy. We're no longer a semi-consolidated democracy, which was the cluster to which we belonged in the past, we are now a hybrid regime. And the European Union, uh, although there may be certain challenges with regard to democratic governments within the European Union itself in certain member states, um, the European Union is certainly not very likely to, to allow new members that are not qualified as democracies. There are going to be no members exceeding, there are going to be no hybrid regimes exceeding to the EU, uh, if you will. And unfortunately, Serbia is the largest country of the Western Balkans right now is a hybrid regime. Uh, we are a one-man rule. We are almost a one-party system. Effectively, uh, our ruling party and this is perhaps a curiosity not known by everybody. The ruling party of Serbia is the largest party in Europe uh, in terms of members. It has 750,000 members. And uh, we are under 7 million voters in Serbia, which means that uh, about one in nine uh, voting uh, Serbian citizens are members of the ruling party. Uh, the very, very distant second and third in Europe are CDU of Germany and uh, Mr. Macron's uh, movement, uh, Republic on Marsh. Uh, when you have such a massive party uh, that happens to control, uh, together with its coalition partners, over 90% of seats in, uh, in a Republican parliament, then I think it's... Uh, it's like red flags all over the place that something tends to be wrong with the way the country is governed. And um, the history of the Balkans is not the history of Serbs or Croats or Bosniaks or other small uh, nations. The history of the Balkans is when you look from a global perspective, it's the history of relations between the great powers. And the histories of small nations are just like stories and sometimes glorious and sometimes tragic in the case of the Balkans, far more skewed to the latter, but generally stories of rise and fall, of uh, glory and tragedy, uh, that are part of a bigger context of relations and frictions and, and sometimes conflicts between major powers. In the Balkans, all the major global actors or most of the global major actors, certainly all the global actors that have been present throughout the history they are still present and they're still engaged. But unfortunately, none of them is engaged strategically in the Balkans, other than to the extent of countering others' influence, making sure that no other major actor becomes dominant. Uh, whereas uh, the goal of strategic integration of the Balkans into the geo orbit geopolitical orbit of one of the actors is currently off the table. Uh, objectively, the only international actor that has the real and uh, uh, I would say tangible capacity to integrate the Balkans into its own realm is the European Union. But right now, for a vast number of reasons, uh, this is just not on the table. It's not in the cards or at least not in the cards in the very near future. And uh, therefore, uh, I'm gonna try and end and wrap up my uh, initial opening by this. You have uh, EU, the United States, Russia, Turkey, and as of recently, China, all preoccupied by short-term considerations when it comes to the Balkans. 
the only player that has the capacity to uh, do something very long term in terms of integration of this part of Europe into its space is, of course, the European Union. I very much hope that uh, the European Union is going to look at the issue of strategic cooperation in the security realm, which is the topic of this conversation, but in all other aspects in a way that it brings back the accession process, but for real, back to the table. Because right now, it's uh, just a uh, short-term relationship between Brussels or key European capitals and, uh, and let's be honest, strongmen of the Balkans, some of which have been with us for a number of years and some of which have been with us for a number of decades. But uh, with serious real plan on integrating into the European family. If that doesn't change, uh, we're going to continue being in a limbo and right now perhaps in a frozen limbo because of COVID, but uh, tomorrow when, when this clouds, when these fogs of COVID disperse in the next 12 to 18 months and all the negative uh, consequences of uh, this global crisis come to the fore, I am afraid that we're going to be facing many more problems and much more significant turbulence in our part of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yeremich. For, just for the sake of comparison, in the communist times in Poland, only one in the 30 citizens was the member of the Communist Party. So you can imagine the, the scale of uh, Serbia's ruling party right now. Okay, uh, Roland, um, the floor is yours. So what, your take on the major uh, security challenges to the cooperation between the European Union and the Western Balkans. Yeah, thanks a lot, Bartek, and thanks a lot to the colleagues and friends from the Pulaski Foundation. And indeed, uh, uh, Kasia Pisarska um, is awesome, and um, we all admire her work um, and uh, that of the other colleagues. And the Martin Center is also proud and happy to cooperate in the uh, Warsaw, Warsaw Security uh, Forum. So, um, to your question, Bartek, um, I think it, I, I have three points. Um, the first one, what is the biggest security risk? I think that one we can quickly, um, uh, we can quickly answer in the sense that it's probably not a major war or a repeat of what we saw in the nineties, but it's kind of, uh, uh, it, a growing instability and a slow decline uh, of the countries, which of course then in themselves may engender some kind of, of violent conflagration. But uh, that, if you ask me the, the straight question, what's the biggest security risk? I would say this is it. Um, but that of course has a couple of, of, of implications and factors that may that may enhance this development or that may indeed actually decrease instability. And here, uh, absolutely agreeing with Vuk Jeremic, the decisive factor indeed is, um, uh, is the relationship with the European Union. And of course, ultimately the accession to the European Union would be the uh, ultimate well, maybe not guarantee, but the highest, the, the, the most effective instrument to ban the spirits of the past. Um, so let me come to my second point, because the, the, the leitmotif here is going to be, unfortunately, that of a vicious circle. And I see in connection with the Western Balkans, three of those vicious circles, in other words, negative developments that actually have a tendency to reinforce themselves. And of course, afterwards, we're gonna, we're gonna discuss about the, the turning the vicious circles into virtuous circles, um, which is the only constructive way of, of dealing with this problem. But which are these three vicious circles? Um, first of all, I would like to, to address the 
uh, the instability question, the decline, which in itself breeds um, uh, 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 weakening of democracy, which then again uh, 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 provides a, a, an obstacle to economic development, which in itself uh, brings young people, bright young people like you guys, uh, to, to sometimes turn their back on their countries, search for a good future elsewhere. And this in itself then reinforces the, the decline development in the country of origin. This is not equally strong in the six Western Balkan countries. There are, there are, slight, uh, there are slight or substantial differentiations, but I can see this as a general trend and I'm telling you no secret here. I don't, I don't think I'm telling you anything new actually. So what I want to say is the vicious circle of of, of decline, instability, and then the other negative developments reinforcing each other. The second one is the vicious circle of um, influence of uh, actors such as Russia, China, Turkey, uh, and Emirates. Um, I would take the US outside of this one, um, it, which, which in itself reinforces a distancing from the European Union. And to have a more distant relationship with the European Union, then again opens up more options and more possibilities for those external actor, uh, actors to actually increase their foothold and their presence. So that's the second vicious circle. The, 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 the more distant EU pre-accession and accession becomes, the more chances are there for Russia and China to, uh, uh, to strengthen their presence. And the stronger that presence becomes, the more countries actually uh, uh, are distancing themselves from the perspective of accession. I mean, a very simple example, um, it, it, you know, Russian and Chinese influence tends to, tends to weaken the rule of law, tends to weaken um, uh, 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 reasonable uh, standards of, um, of uh, legal, of transparency in uh, investment questions and other strategic economic developments so that, so that uh, you know, there's, there's almost like a, a proportionate, um, uh, like communicating vessels uh, between getting closer to China at the moment and actually making it more difficult for countries like Serbia to actually uh, adopt the acquis communautaire, both in legal terms and technical terms, but also in political terms. So that was the second one. And the third vicious circle, I would say, is yeah, the pre-accession process itself. Um, you know, the, 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 the obvious um, uh, difficulties of the European Union to, um, uh, to provide a concrete perspective on when and how accession is possible. And I, I think there are some rational reasons for that. You know, it's not ill will or, or, or laziness of Brussels bureaucrats or something. There are concrete reasons for this, but we're coming to that later. But the very fact that the accession process is, um, is disappointing to many people, also public opinion in the Western Balkan countries, produces precisely the stagnation and the loss of faith in uh, rule of law and the democratic process, which then in turn uh, makes it more difficult for the Commission to provide positive assessments of progress in, in the pre-accession process in these countries. So we have these three vicious circles. One is instability, decline, um, um, uh, and, 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 and weakening of, of, of the democratic process and the rule of law. The second one is, you know, external actor, actors, especially Russia and China, actually propelling the, uh, or, or weakening, weakening the links to the European Union. And the third one is the uh, uh, a kind of disappointment in uh, uh, pre-accession and accession processes and negotiations producing their own obstacles to further integration with the European Union. So how do we address that? I think that should mainly be the, 
the the subject of our of our of our debate uh, for the rest of the the time here. But um, let me let me just um, address three points uh, about the European Union itself. I'm not now not addressing the countries of the Western Balkans. I'm talking about the EU, and uh, I, I see three main obstacles to the EU getting its act together on uh, a Western Balkan strategy. And the first one, and probably even most difficult to overcome, is the disunity among the member states, um, among the big member states especially. Uh, I mean, you could see last year, all of, or most of 2019, was characterized by a strong disagreement between Berlin and Paris, between Germany and France, between Merkel and Macron, about starting membership negotiations with Albania and North Macedonia. Sorry, North Macedonia. Um, that was absolutely characteristic for the different approaches to Western Balkan enlargement and to uh, uh, how to project stability and how to project prosperity uh, and security uh, uh, from the European Union to uh, the countries of the Western Balkans. Um, you know, and about Macron, let me, let me say, I, I think his blocking the beginning of membership talks to those two countries was a huge mistake. There's no debate about that. But I'm trying to understand, and I'm, I, I think that he had a certain point about a couple of things. Most of all, that our negotiation process up to now is faulty that if we, for example, if we don't start um, it, it, talking about the rule of law as point number one in membership in accession negotiations, we might as well forget about the rest. That was a valid point. And actually the commission had been proposing that for a long time. So, you know, reforming the accession process and the sequencing of things to be negotiated um, I think is, is, is a major thing. And, you know, whether it was a face-saving measure or whether it was an actual reason, but after this resequencing uh, of negotiation points had been agreed, France agreed to the beginning of membership uh, negotiations with those countries. So, you know, I think, I, I, I think, you know, if we can't agree on how exactly, or which countries exactly should come in when, or with whom we, sh we should start to negotiate when, uh, let's at least internally uh, downside, try to downsize the problem and talk about uh, the, the technicalities, which have very, very political implications, of course, of the enlargement process. And, you know, uh, no country, not even France or the Netherlands or Denmark, uh, because these are the usual suspects of skeptics about enlargement, none of those countries has said we will never ever going to enlarge again. Um, so that's, <laughs> and, you know, modestly speaking, that's already a positive sign, I would say, in this situation. Uh, the, second, the second point is what I would call enlargement fatigue. Uh, that means, that, and this refers much more to public opinion in many member states, not just Denmark, Netherlands, France, but also certainly Germany, certainly Austria. Um, uh, uh, lots of countries in uh, especially Western Europe are extremely skeptical about enlargement as such, because um, it is said that the 2004 uh, Big Bang enlargements were too many uh, too soon. And certainly the 2007 enlargement by Romania and Bulgaria had a huge blunder by giving a target date uh, beforehand and, and, and then uh, actually uh, uh, having these countries uh, join the European Union at a moment when they were far from prepared under rule of law uh, 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 aspects, uh, fighting corruption, uh, fighting organized crime, uh, all this was, was, was not there by the moment they, uh, they uh, joined the European Union. Um, I think partly this part of enlargement fatigue, I think, can be addressed rationally by pointing to better uh, sequencing of the negotiations, more thorough checking by the Commission whether the countries are really ready and so on and so on. And 
to conclude here, the, the third reason, the third obstacle to the EU becoming a more effective uh, uh, actor in the Western Balkans and, and providing the, uh, a, an effective accession perspective, of course, is the like by now permanent crisis mood in the European Union itself. I mean, like the feeling we have so much on our plate, there is no way we can devote the, the material resources, the mental resources, the political energy to actually uh, uh, now concentrate on something like the pre-accession process and, and how to get the Western Balkan countries to join the European Union. I mean, there the answer is clear. I mean, we, 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 can, only, we can only become an effective actor in the Western Balkans if we at least start to more effectively address our own problems. Um, and, uh, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with this. Um, I think these three questions, the unity of the member states, and that takes leadership and it takes persuasion and it takes compromise. So EU unity needs to be addressed. Enlargement fatigue uh, among the member states and especially the, uh, the societies uh, in the member states needs to be addressed. And third, we somehow need to get ourselves out of this cri permanent crisis mood and get to a more positive feeling about ourselves and then it will be possible to positively positively address the Western Balkans integration question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rond. I'm actually quite happy how much you guys divided into two pillars, like Mr. Jeremy, which was talking about the perks and irks from the inside of the uh, Western Balkans region, and you, Roland, you were quite vocal when it comes to the, 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 the perks and irks from within the European Union. Uh, but to continue on that, and what, before I go there, like a, just a footnote uh, to all the participants, uh, please remember that you have this ability to, to ask the questions via chat box. And if we have time, of course, I will try to reserve as much as possible. Uh, I will take the questions out from, uh, from, from the audience as well uh, during the, the last 30 minutes. Um, Roland, just a short, short follow-up on, on what you actually said, because you were talking about the, uh, the, the unity, the, uh, the EU enlargement policy, and basically facing the attitudes that are within the European Union. Um, I want to ask you quite a provocative question. Uh, tell me, uh, do you believe that we are safer as the Union with or without the Western Balkan states in our borders? Are we, maybe we'll be much more fruitful in securing the, the security of European Union, not uh, engaging the Western Balkans as the member states. What is your take on that? Uh, I'll give you a very clear answer. It depends. Um, in other words, what I want to say is, I think it largely depends on the, the, on the time frame that we're talking about. To have the Western Balkans in their present state, all six countries, members of the European Union at this moment, I do not think would, would increase the stability and the security and the effectiveness of the European Union. Period. You know, that's a, that's a fact. And I, I, I seriously don't think anyone in the Western Balkan countries themselves would, would fundamentally disagree with that statement. Um, over time, and well, we can discuss how long time, whether we're talking five, 10 or 15 years, but over time, absolutely, the European Union's prosperity or security and therefore stability and prosperity will be enhanced by the Western Balkan countries becoming members of the European Union. You know, uh, they belong into the European Union, not only for cultural and historical reasons, but also for security reasons. The question is how to get there and when, how to sequence the process and which country joins when, under what circumstances. And that's the whole, that's the whole debate. So, so, you know, this was a long answer to your question, uh, but, uh, but it's, it's certainly, it's not a clear yes, no question um, uh, uh, without specifying the elements that I outlined. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, Roland, you said that uh, no one would disagree with that opinion from the Western Balkans. Uh, Mr. Jeremic, would you agree or disagree? I would strongly agree with Roland. Uh, at this current moment, like, how could you imagine having uh, anyone from the Western Balkans uh, part of the uh, European discourse and discussions? And 
you have, I mean, again, I'm going to try and, uh, and concentrate on Serbia because I understand the dynamics of Serbia best. Uh, imagine having two Orbans and not one Orban at the European table, only this new one uh, being the uh, open admirer of both uh, uh, Putin and Trump and a secret admirer of Erdogan. Uh, that's not how you add up to the, uh, to the ease or contribute to the ease of the liberations and in general uh, stability of the European continent. I totally agree with Roland, therefore, uh, not just about the current moment, but about the long term. The long term, it's definitely uh, the only way to strategically enhance the stability of the entire European landmass, given the geography of the Western Balkans, but also history and culture. Now, I, I'd add a little caveat to what Roland said. Uh, it is not possible to keep the Balkans in the steady state without uh, enhancing the process of integration, which at this very moment uh, has subsided and as a matter of fact, started going in the wrong, in the opposite direction to, uh, to where we would like to see it. And uh, I think it's an illusion that uh, you can somehow leave it in the, in the shelf, put it on the shelf, put it in a drawer, and then after a better moment comes, when it comes in the context of European uh, readiness and preparedness and political uh, will to continue with the process of enlargement, then we're going to take it out of the shelf. Because what you will have found, what you will have found in the shelf under the circumstances would be something very deeply rotten and in a much worse shape than uh, it was at the time when you were putting it in the drawer. So uh, I believe that a, hand, a much more of a hands-on approach right now, and especially when it comes to the rule of law especially when it comes to the upholding and the honoring of uh, basic values that, uh, that are uh, inherent in the, uh, in the foundations of the European project. Paying much more attention to those right now would be, uh, would be well advised. That's my 10 cents from the inside. Okay, so um... For the sake of the European Union security, it is not the question now or never, it is the question when, like both of you seem to agree on that, on that point. Um, actually, there's, there was an incoming question from the audience, since it is very, um, let's say, ad vosem to what you were talking about. Uh, I'll just read it out and then we'll take, uh, and then Roland will take the floor because he, he raised his hand. Uh, so um, our friends from the audience, they uh, they have this impression that maybe this uh, this potential time between uh, between the what is actually going on right now and the European Union membership of the Western Balkan states, it gives floor for uh, uh, Russian, Turkish, and, and and Arab influence in those countries to even more, to to penetrate even more the uh, the state of uh, of uh, of those countries. So, if you could take that into account while replying, how to address this uh, issue that uh, we have to take time before the Western Balkan states be the member of the European Union. But there is also this time, that this time is given not only for us to, 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 to prepare for, 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 the, for the membership of the Western Balkan states, but it's also the time that is given for, uh, for those external actors to, 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 be, to, meddle, to, to meddle even more than they do right now. Ron, now is your turn, please. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um... Look, I, of course I don't disagree with Vuk in saying that uh, the, it, you cannot keep the Western Balkans stable without speeding up or, or, or making more concrete the process of pre-accession and, and, and ultimately integration. I mean, yeah, more hands-on approach. Look, we can all agree on this, but let me, let me be a little bit more concrete um, maybe it's a pity that we don't have uh, 
um, uh, Mr. Mr. Vucic here among us because, uh, you know, he, he certainly would say, all right, well, if the EU toughens up its rule of law conditions, that will only drive us further away. You know, then I will have to even, even more intensely throw myself into the arms of the fraternal Chinese people, kiss more Chinese flags, and, 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 and this in itself, as I said before, that will just reinforce and accelerate the vicious circle. So I'm at a loss, frankly speaking. And, and you know, I have talked in my third point mostly about the obstacles inside the EU itself. But I tell you one thing, and, and Vuk, I really respect what you said, and, and, and I, I respect all Democrats that uh, risk a lot in terms of their, their own personal freedom and, and well-being and economic prosperity in struggling against authoritarian rulers. I mean, that's always, I've always had great admiration for, for Democrats in uh, countries that are on the verge of authoritarianism or have already crossed the threshold. But ultimately, no one outside can do the job for those Democrats um, with, anything, with anything external, with any external instrument. You know, I mean, unless you send in the Marines, but I'm afraid that, first of all, we don't have Marines, and second, we wouldn't send them anywhere for that purpose of regime change. Um, you know, that's been done in 2003 in Iraq with fatal consequences. So, um, as, as our president of the Martin Center, Zorinda, always says, you know, he's a marathon runner and, and he, he always compares the, the reform process uh, and the strengthening of rule of law and modernization of countries like the Western Balkans, but also Ukraine and other East European countries, he compares that to a marathon runner. Um, the, the, the spectator or even the supporter from the outside can do things to, to help and pass a glass of water or cheer them on um, or maybe straighten up the road a little bit. But the ultimate job has to be done by the runner himself or herself. That is the key. And that's why when I was deliberately talking about the European Union and its own its internal obstacles in the beginning statement. But I must say that when it comes to accession, the key is not in Brussels, Berlin, Paris, or Copenhagen. The key is in the capitals, in the countries, with the populations of the Western Balkan countries. And, you know, maybe I, now I look like someone passing the blame or passing the buck or something, but I can't come up with any other ultimate answer, but that any external actor can only support, uh, endorse, make it a little bit easier, or in the worst case, of course, make it a little harder for countries like the countries in the Western Balkans um, to achieve more stability, prosperity, and democracy. Uh, but ultimately, the job has to be done by those countries themselves. Okay, as I can see that our discussion actually flows into that direction that we uh, that we are thinking that the, the, the basis for the uh, co cooperation on the external uh, threats to our security is actually starts at home. That's why we are talking so much about the EU enlargement and that's why we are talking so much about uh, from where to start. Um, and, but allow me please to, to, to follow up on those attitudes within the region, because it is commonly said, and you, you gentlemen have already mentioned that, that the, one of the major security challenges in the Western Balkans paradoxically comes from within the states themselves. And uh, this is the state capture politics. This is this uh, large co corruption, corruption that is often mentioned by the European Union. And what I'm looking here actually, and that's the question to, to Mr. Jeremic, uh, it's uh, one simple answer, if you could. Um, what is the root of this vulnerability? Because we're, we, we all know that, uh, or we are aware of the fact, as you mentioned, that uh, there is this hybrid regime, may, maybe not right now in Serbia, that, um, that before we go into enlargement policies, before we go into enlargement as such, we have to deal with the rule of law in, in the Western Balkans. But where does this 
attitude of the Western Balkan states, their, uh, their vulnerability to Russian and, and Chinese influence come from? Well, it's, uh, I think it's, uh, let, let, let's try to make things much more simple. Uh, if there is going to be an accession to Europe one day, this part of the world has to start looking far more like Europe than it looks like right now. And how we got to this point is, uh, is a probably a very, very long discussion of, uh, of, of recent history and, and the developments and mistakes from recent history and particularly during the 1990s uh, that have their own roots and previous historic uh, developments. But I don't want us to get too tangled into that. Basically, the only external actor that is uh, paying lip service, advocating. Now, we can debate how serious or not serious this uh, advocacy is, but the only external actor that uh, is engaged in the Balkans that uh, continues to, to advocate for liberal democracy as a form of governance as a desired form of governance is the European Union. Obviously, Russia is not doing it, China is not doing it, Turkey is not doing it, and the United States uh, ceased to do that uh, in the past uh, few years. So the only external actor advocating liberal democracy is Europe. And the European Union, most of the countries of the European Union, and the European Commission itself. They choose not to call spade a spade when it comes to the uh, lack of basic fundamental freedoms throughout the Western Balkans and in Serbia. The situation is perhaps more drastic than elsewhere. Uh, I think that the European Union has the most to lose with the continuation of this of this uh, situation, external influence of Russia is, uh, so we, we sometimes spend too much time discussing the influence of Russia uh, in Serbia. Russia is an ideal situation when it comes to Serbia. Uh, Russia, uh, it is in the deep interest of Russia that nothing changes in Serbia and the Western Balkans. Because for as long as we have a situation like this, there can be no move, no serious move towards accession, towards integration of uh, parts of the entire or the entire Western Balkans into the European Union. So therefore their strategic interest is there because it'd be very much of a complicated situation, it'd be far more difficult for Russia to exercise its influence if, if the region were fully integrated uh, in, the European, uh, in the European structures. They maintain their interest and their control when it comes to the energy supply and, uh, and the management of, uh, of energy resources in Serbia. Uh, there's a lot of corruption present there, both within the government and within the state companies that deal with this. This is another big uh, uh, point of interest for Russia. And you know, the best thing for them is that it comes at a zero cost. They don't have to invest anything into this. They just need to maintain this uh, threat of veto in the Security Council in the case uh, something to do with Kosovo comes to the table, comes to the agenda of the Security Council. So their, um, their threat of using this veto, which comes at a zero cost for them, assures their both tactical interest in Serbia, which is mostly to do with energy, and strategic interest, which is to do with making sure that there is a part of the European continent that is not fully integrated into the rest uh, of, the, of the continent uh, itself. When it comes to China, it is a little bit different. Uh, China is making serious investment or, and, and ready to make very serious investment in this country. What are the conditions for this investment? This is, of course, something to be discussed and debated and, 
and, uh, and environmental concerns and, and financial concerns long term, it's obviously a thing to be looked at very, very, very closely. But unlike Russians, they are prepared to put things on the table. And, uh, and they realized that uh, it's a very fruitful, it, it's, it's a very easy place for them to do that because of the lack of uh, the rule of law strictures and the governance and the good governance strictures that innately come from the uh, enhancement of the EU integration process. So, and, and, and when it comes to Turkey, and I'll finish with that, uh, I don't think that uh, Turkey is right now too much in the front of uh, exercising influence in our part of the world. They are much more preoccupied with with other theaters from the Caucasus to the Eastern Mediterranean to, uh, to Libya, Northern Africa, and so on and so forth. I don't think that it is at the, at the front uh, of their concerns. Although, uh, if things go really negatively, if things uh, explode somehow uh, in the Balkans, uh, I'm sure that uh, just like in the Caucasus right now, when they have engaged very, very uh, severely and decisively on, on one of the sides in the newest Caucasus conflict, uh, if things go in a bad direction here in, uh, in the Balkans, they could, uh, they could re-engage in a much more significant way. But right now, uh, the Western Balkans is Europe's to lose. And <laughs> I am afraid right now that uh, things seem to be progressing in, in that direction. Okay, allow me to, to take the, those last minutes of our discussion because later on we'll be proceeding to taking the questions from the audience uh, to spice up the discussion with my own interest. Uh, so that, that's the question of my own interest. Um, Roland, at some point you left the US out of the, of the discussion. And uh, you, Mr. Yeremich, you mentioned that the, the European Union is the only actor that is advocating for the rule of law in the Western Balkans. So now I'm back to my beloved Trump-like idea and uh, asking you about this recent rapprochement between Serbia and Kosovo. It, could it be regarded as the success of the, Europe, of, the, of the United States in the region? Because for many Europeans, it was, however, something simply entangled into the presidential campaign in the U.S. And that is also the question about the lack of cooperation between the U.S. and the European Union in the region. Do we still share the same goals in the Western Balkans? Roland, could you start on that? Yeah, uh, you know, we, we're all in risk of making the mistake that uh, the friends of the United States made in 2015 and 16 before the election. We consider the current status quo as something that will continue. Um, well, my prediction, um, my, my strong hope, and I think also a prediction based on probability is that we will get a change of the administration of Washington. And that means a lot of things will be easier. Um, vis-a-vis uh, -vis China, vis-a-vis -vis Russia, but also also vis-a-vis -vis the Western Balkan, uh, uh, Western Balkan countries in terms of transatlantic cooperation and, you know, maybe not uh, sharing exactly the same strategy, but at least having joint goals um, and coordinating between ourselves who does what when. I think that will be much, much easier uh, and actually it will be probable with a Joe Biden, uh, Kamala Harris administration. But um, let me let me briefly um, uh, come come to this um, uh, question of, uh, for example, uh, what Vuk mentioned with with uh, with Russia. I absolutely agree. Russia is a spoiler. Russia doesn't have the instruments to be an active, constructive, positive. Um, uh, force in the Western Balkans doesn't even want to be constructive. It wants to prevent NATO enlargement uh, overtly and covertly actually also EU enlargement to the Western Balkans. Um, so that's clear. China, um, yes, it has serious um, uh, assets. Uh, uh, it can offer a lot of cash, but let me re-emphasize here 
the number one investor in the Western Balkan countries is not China, it's the European Union. The number one trade partner for the Western Balkan countries is not China, it's the European Union. The number one assistance provider in the Western Balkan countries is not China, it's the European Union. We have made a humongous mistake by not emphasizing this in the COVID-19 crisis, especially in the beginning, um, that, you know, uh, China is punching above its weight. I mean, China is heavy, it is a heavyweight uh, fighter, but it is punching far above its weight in the Western Balkan countries when it comes to who is really the partner in economic terms, and I'm not even talking about accession uh, perspective or so, just in current economic terms, who is the number one partner is the European Union. So, I mean, we, as I said, we, we, we just somehow failed to transmit this into uh, the public consciousness in those countries. Um, so, uh, it, but coming back to your, to your question, Bartek, about um, uh, uh, coordination from the outside, I think things will become much, much easier after November 3rd or after the inauguration, which is, which is probably going to be uh, in, in the beginning of, of, of 2021. Thank you very much. And since we have two more minutes of our own discussion, Mr. Yeremich, could you uh, explain your take on the US engagement in the region and versus the European Union? I agree with uh, Roland that uh, things are uh, a little bit, uh, you know, fluid right now uh, in the run up to the uh, American elections. And obviously this, uh, this thing that uh, it happened last month in Washington um, caught everybody's attention. And, uh, and, I, and in my own opinion, it's, uh, it was just uh, a flash in a pan. It was, it was really used to just to, for the purpose of uh, enhancing campaign of Donald Trump and not to do with anything with the Western Balkans. It was far more to do with, uh, with Israel and the Middle East. And uh, this piece of paper, actually several pieces of paper that were signed in the White House. Um, I say pieces of paper, it's very difficult to define what was what was signed, it can be called an agreement, it cannot be called, uh, uh, and it cannot be easily defined uh, given that there was a series of non-papers. Uh, a much more significant, actually the only significant uh, element was to do with, uh, with the Middle East rather than, than actually the Western Balkans itself. And, um, and the big announcement that we're gonna have uh, the FC office, uh, in the region, which is, you know, potentially very big and important and signals uh, American readiness to, to start making investments and might look like something that is going to counter in the future uh, this vast Chinese uh, readiness and assets that they're ready to put uh, on the table. Um, I would be, I'd be conservative when it comes to, uh, when it comes to the prospects for this, uh, uh, taking up the ground because uh, the rules and regulations of the DFC uh, in conjunction with the uh, Foreign uh, Corruption Practices Act, which is a very significant part of, uh, of the American uh, system, both in America and abroad, uh, basically disallow for any serious American investment to be made under the auspices of the DFC because uh, the way things are run in Serbia, including in the economic realm, uh, are simply nowhere near the standard required by the engagement of, uh, of American development institutions and American private capital to that end that falls under the auspices of the Foreign uh, Corruption Practices Act. Uh, so uh, I agree with Roland uh, that uh, EU is number one in pretty much, uh, you know, every league table when it comes to the Western Balkans, from investments to aid to, to everything else. But do not underestimate the, uh, the attractiveness of working with others where uh, 
when there is no sane understanding of ethics, when there is no sane um, strictures when it comes to the potential for corruption of uh, local and, uh, and state officials with regard to certain projects, uh, the sea of opportunities exist uh, outside the European Union in the United States in this regard. And coming back the long way to where I started, when the fundamental issue in a country is uh, with the rule of law, then one should not be surprised that uh, there is an enhanced attractiveness of those who do not top the big tables according to the criteria that Mahant listed. Thanks. Thank you. Well, we, we all remember uh, Mr. Vucic's uh, shocked face when he was about to sign documents uh, in the Oval Office. Um, Roland, you raise your hand, please, but uh, be aware that, uh, please be brief because uh, we are about to start questioning the, the guys from the audience, okay? Yeah, thanks, thanks Bartek. Well, if I may, I want to, I want to um, respond to Vuk, uh, but also take one of the questions that I, that I read in the group chat already. And this question of the EU calling a spade a spade and, 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 and talk and, and really calling out authoritarian developments in Western Balkan countries. And I'd like to take Serbia's example here. In uh, my preparation for this, I looked at the uh, commission report uh, 2020 on the progress report on Serbia. Um, and indeed, it talks clearly, you know, this is bureaucrats language, but it says the continued political influence in the judiciary is of serious concern. Now, you know, I mean, if, 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 you, if you know the lingo of Brussels bureaucrats, I mean, that's like, that's like an alarm going off, right? Um, that means uh, that, is, that is about as much naming and shaming as you get from bureaucrats, not only in Brussels, but anywhere. So, uh, so the, the, the EU is, is naming the problem here. Next one freedom of expressions, even clearer. The report clearly speaks of intimidation and threats and violence against journalists and, and, and says this is completely incompatible with EU values and with, uh, with the, actually the rules of the game of the pre-accession process. But what else can the European Union do? You know, and I, I, I make you one prediction. If as a consequence of this, the EU says, all right, you are not only not sticking to the rule of law, you're actually even weakening it further. So there will be economic consequences now. So we reduce our assistance. We, uh, we ditch our COVID-19 assistance to Serbia. What do you think the consequence of that would be? I'll leave it to you. I mean, sorry, I'm getting a bit passionate here, but we're all on the same side, you know? I'm not arguing against you, but I'm just trying to make you think, if you say that the EU is not tough enough on rule of law, and at the same time you're saying, oh, the EU is not devoting enough energy and, and, and economic investment um, into the Western Balkans, well, please make up your mind, folks. It doesn't, I mean, it's either or. Uh, and I'm afraid that what, what Brussels has been trying and also the, the, the capitals of the other member states have been trying is walking a tightrope. We're always between Skiller and Charybdis. We're, we're, we're between a rock and a hard place. It is, this is so difficult to, to find the right balance of, you know, if you want the carrot and the stick. Um, uh, and, and, and believe me, I'm far from saying we found the optimum here. We haven't, certainly not. We need to try harder. But there is a basic contradiction in many of the complaints that I hear about EU policy towards the Western Balkans. That's what I would like to, uh, to emphasize. And I already addressed one of the audience questions. Thank you, Roland. Uh, Mr. Yermi, do you want to, to, to address the same question? Okay, okay. well, uh, just a short comment on my side with, to, to what Roland actually said. Um, me coming from Poland. Um, yes, even within the European Union, uh, there are problems with the rule of law. It is the state that has to address them at, inside the, the, the democratic uh, um, rules that are happening in the state. And the European Union can help, 
that's for, that's for sure but it will never uh it will never solve the problem i i totally agree with that mr yermich yes please i very much appreciate uh, roland's uh, enthusiasm for the region and uh, I'm, I'm so happy that there are people especially close to the epp that uh that are so much passionate about this part of the world uh, I'm, I'm trying to enhance uh their interest in being a liberal conservative myself and being uh, a leader of a party that aspires to join EPP one day. Uh, I, I understand how Europe works and I understand that uh, it's always like walking on the tightrope. Uh, this is uh, an innate thing uh, of the European construct, working on a tightrope and making sure that there is uh, a process of reaching a certain uh, agreements, uh, reaching consensus. Uh, which is always a difficult thing. But speaking about external actors, and the EU is an external actor for the time being, external actor in the Balkans, do you really think that others are walking a tightrope? Is Putin walking a tightrope? Is Xi Jinping walking a tightrope? Is Erdogan or Donald Trump? Are these guys walking a tightrope? They're not. They just go in, they take what they need, um, the last one who went in and took what he needed was Donald Trump, proverbially speaking. He did not go to the Balkans. He, he had the, the guys come over to the, to the White House, to the Oval Office, and sign agreements to do with the moving of the uh, embassies to Jerusalem and whatnot. Uh, by the way, they did discuss uh, a trip of Donald Trump uh, to the Balkans, to Serbia, to hold a rally in Belgrade before November 3rd and, uh, and thank God that uh, things gotten into a way of that uh, and then this didn't happen, but they did discuss it. And those are the type of things uh, that, that Donald Trump was interesting, was interested in when it comes to the Balkans. These guys, they just go in, they don't walk a tightrope, they take what they want and they go back and they leave us in the way we are right now, totally inadequate when it comes to our capacity to progress significantly along the line of EU integration. You know, the only good thing about Donald Trump performing in Belgrade is that they would have to remove all the pro-China posters and the, the ads of Chinese companies in the airport and on the road to the, to the town. They would do that in a split second, and then they would bring them back after he leaves. <laughs> that's, how, that's, that, that's how their mental structure is. You know, there was one comedy in Poland, and the guy was sitting in the, in the cabinet, and then he had uh, a big image behind him. Uh, on, on one side it was Hitler, on the other side it was Stalin. And whoever came to the room, he was just switching them. So I guess the same with Trump and Xi Jinping right now. He's Serbian. Pardon, pardon me. Okay, uh, gentlemen, that was a pleasure. Uh, I guess uh, at some point we really get into the, the discussion, not only, you know, um, talking, uh, you know, points, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, since we are here for the participants, we have to, uh, we have to acknowledge that and take the questions from, from the audience. And um, I, um, I would actually want uh, the people who are uh, writing down the question, uh, uh, the questions, to unmute themselves and to ask those questions directly to our uh, to our beloved guests, because I guess that will be much more engaging for for, for you. And uh, the first person, uh, uh, I'm taking the questions from down uh, down of the of the of the chat, uh, is uh, Mr. Subotic from Serbia. Uh, if you could unmute yourself and was, mm -hmm. ask one of those questions, because we have a lot of people incoming. Okay, uh, I had many questions for Mr. Jeremic, but uh, I'll ask the second one. Uh, I'm, first of all, my name is Tajin Subotic. I'm fr uh, from Belgrade, working as a researcher on the European Policy Center, a think tank based in Belgrade. Uh, and we are currently analyzing actually the role of China, Turkey, and Russia. And we plan to publish the study in November. It will be really comprehensive and in detail. Uh, regarding the question, uh, we analyze that the Serbia's low alignment rate when it comes to the EU's common foreign and security policy is not a novelty. It started back in 2008 and especially 2009 when we signed a strategic partnership with China, but also 
we had a strategic partnership with Russia in 2013. So my question is, uh, as this is a trend that started back with your administration, do you endorse the way Serbia continues to unconditionally stand by China and Russia today? Uh, the latest examples of this unconditional support uh, happened when, for example, Serbia refused to align with an EU declaration uh, that condemned poisoning of uh, Mr. Navalny, the Russian opposition politician. And recently we also supported uh, uh, China's moves uh, and its policy in uh, Xinjiang against the Uyghurs. So as those are really hot topics, uh, uh, I would like to see, do you endorse these um, moves or do you think Serbia should adjust its policies to China and Russia? Thank you. Uh, so uh, if I were Vucic, I would stick to it. And I will actually double down because it obviously comes at uh, no cost. So why? Why would I change this? It works perfectly well. Uh, I do that. I support Russia. I support China. And then I get a visit with President Macron. Uh, he makes uh, a great effort to deliver a speech in Serbian. He goes away. He goes back to Paris with uh, an agreement to get the Belgrade airport. He doesn't mention to me this Russia and China thing. So why would I not? support Russia and China and get points uh, in Beijing and Moscow when we're, it doesn't cost me a thing. So if I were him, I'd stick to it. If I can just add a sub question, how can the EU raise the costs, maybe? Well, um, when EU wants to raise a cost, uh, when the EU starts uh, rushing a little bit along this tightrope uh, that Roland and I mentioned earlier, then there are results and uh, the obvious one was uh, the withdrawal from this uh, military exercise with Russia and Belarus. Uh, it was right uh, like, like a day or two days before the commencement of this military exercise. I'm talking about last month. Uh, Slavic Brotherhood was the military exercise and Serbia withdrew from it at the last moment. They did that uh, because there were so many people uh, fuming in Brussels after this uh, uh, ludicrous episode in the White House uh, with the signing of these documents. And, uh, and, and people were really angry. And uh, Vucic is a very, I would say, developed political animal sensing when people are angry. And then he took this step. Uh, according to my, uh, to my information, he committed uh, to doing the Slavic Brotherhood next year after the situation kind of subsides. So uh, when you show uh, teeth, if you will, then he reacts. And okay. Ro Sorry, I interrupted you. Uh, uh but I guess you were like, that, that was the period on, on, at the end of the sentence. Uh, Roland, you wanted to... Yeah, on something. Russia. Yeah. Uh, very briefly, I, I think when we talk about the, the actual perspective of Serbia in its present state, I mean, not concerning rule of law and so on, but just the, the Russia angle, Serbia with this relationship to Russia would hit multiple vetoes among the Eastern member states of the European Union. Seriously. I mean, this is maybe the elephant in the room, but, but some of the people who are fuming in Brussels were not only the Eurocrats and West Europeans who uh, didn't like the pro-Israeli, pro-Jerusalem stance. Those were Bolts and Poles and other Central Europeans who just cannot stomach the kind of relationship, uh, you know, that a country has with Russia, uh, calling an exercise Slavic Brotherhood. I mean, sorry. That, that's a no-go, and, and we, we have, we're not discussing this openly uh, until now, but believe me, this will come to the, to the fore, and this will be openly discussed if and when Serbia gets closer to accession. And with the, the current relationship with Russia would be unbearable for a whole number of member states of the European Union, irrespective of 
Jerusalem and Israel and 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 those questions uh, that were that were in the foreground in the White House uh, ceremony. Well, yes, I believe that uh, even in Poland, in Polish newspapers, the uh, the Slavic Brotherhood uh, was quite, had a lot of uh, not pleasant remarks, actually. And um, yes, uh, Katarina, because your question actually got a lot of upvotes. I guess that was the question to which Roland was referring at some point. Uh, but if you are willing to 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 shape it uh, a little bit differently, or you still want to, it to be answered by, for example, Mr. Yeremich, so please go ahead. Good morning, hi, uh, hi, Roland. Um, and Mr. Yeremich, I posed a question. Let me just read it so that I don't, it will be better like this. Okay, uh, you mentioned it's a marathon run. It is. Uh, I agree completely about the entire reform process that all the Western Balkan countries should undertake and more speedy so that they are closer to the EU criteria and to their accession. But don't you agree that the EU is also actively ignoring authoritarianism and bre breach of the rule of law in the Western Balkan countries. I can just name three examples right now. It was Montenegro for 20 years, North Macedonia under Nikola Gruevski, and now in Serbia. Uh, because I don't see the EU being super vocal about uh, what is Vucic doing internally, domestically, not his dance with uh, the external actors like Russia and China, but about what he's doing uh, domestically in uh, Serbia. On another note, would you agree, Roland, but also Vukeramic, I would like to hear your opinion about this. Uh, the enlargement package with the Western Balkan countries, should it, shouldn't it be taken case by case, not as a whole package, because the pieces of integration are not the same. Now we have Montenegro as front runner. Serbia is even very advanced in her negotiation process, but let's say Kosovo and Bosnia and Herzegovina are not even candidate countries. So I hear, keep hearing this, like this is the message also from the EU that this is a package, the Western Balkan countries, but isn't it better and also for the EU, but also for the countries to take, uh, to uh, dismantle this package and uh, actually observe and uh, address the countries one by one. Thanks. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks, Katerina. These are a couple of good points. Um, on the case-by-case -case approach, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, I'm, I'm not 100% sure because I haven't been talking to, to uh, negotiators uh, uh, recently. But as far as I see the situation, it is case-by-case. -case. I mean, yes, you can talk about a package or not. But I mean, you, you said yourself, I mean, we, we're, we're, we're negotiating with two countries, we're about to negotiate with two other countries, and the two countries, Bosnia and, and Kosovo, are for very specific reasons, not negotiating uh, right now or in the very near future. About, about Kosovo, we all know that the EU is, I mean, not even all EU countries have recognized Kosovo as an independent state. Uh, you know, Spain for Catalonian, for the Catalonian factor and so on and so on. Um, so, it, and, and, and Bosnia, look, that's, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina is, is a very, very special case for reasons I don't have to, uh, to lay out here. Um, yeah, you know, in largely the domestic setup of the country and the, the lack of a consensus in the country itself about the, the future course, um, just to name one thing. Uh, so, I think we have a de facto case by case approach already, you know, I, and, and frankly speaking, I don't know anyone in Brussels, maybe I missed something, but I don't know anyone in Brussels who is saying that we can only take in those six countries at the same moment. Uh, I, I don't think this is the approach uh, in the European Union. So, so, you know, whether we call it case by case or not, it is case by case. Uh, I'll, I, I actually agree with Ron on this one. Uh, I think it should be looked at as a package. Uh, I think that the political will to address comes uh, in the context of the entire region, but that the process itself ought to be parsed out and 
and separate it to all the different uh, uh, accession um, candidates. Uh, but I, I, I can't, but like, uh, we address the Slavic Brotherhood thing because Slavic Brotherhood is something that uh, I can imagine causes fear in certain Slavic countries, uh, Poland and, 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 and others. Uh, do you know for how many years there is a Slavic Brotherhood exercise going on? It was held for the first time in 2015, and it's a yearly exercise. So 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019. 2019 was actually, it was held in Serbia, uh, the Belarus-Russian-Serbian exercises. And then in the middle of this Slavic Brotherhood Bonanza, you have Donald Tusk coming to Belgrade and saying in Serbian, that Alexander Vucic is his soulmate and the greatest Serb that he has ever met. And then Vucic wraps up uh, the meeting and leaves for Moscow to participate in a parade. So why would we refrain from the Slavic Brotherhood? If I were Vucic, I wouldn't, uh, given this situation. Uh, Donald, Donald yeah. Tusk has stopped talking like this to Mr. Vucic, either in public and all the more in private. So let me assure you, you know, my office is, is next door uh, from, from the one of Donald Tusk as president of the European People's Party. And, uh, and I can assure you that, that there are some people criticizing Donald Tusk for not, uh, not being friendly enough. Um, uh, to Mr. Vucic, right? So hey, that's, that's about all I can say. Um, but uh, again, you know, this is just another demonstration of the tightrope that I was talking about before, right? I mean, they, 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 and, and this, is, this is much wider than the person of Donald Tusk. This is people in Brussels that care about the Western Balkans are like torn apart internally. You know, it's like, yeah, what, what kind of rough love is expected from us uh, by the Democrats on the Western Balkans, right? Uh, yes, of course, I totally agree. We should, be, we should be tougher and also publicly tougher on the authoritarian rulers. Absolutely agreed. But what if this backfires and it only reinforces the trends that we actually want to avoid, you know, which is like, you know, the famous saying that you, we are, we're just throwing themselves, we're throwing them into the arms of of Russia, China, Turkey, the Emirates, and whoever. I mean, this is the constant dilemma, uh, by the way, also for other countries like Ukraine, the argument has been made all the time. And this is very, very smartly used by the autocrats because they know exactly about this dilemma. They, they themselves are saying, at least behind the scenes, oh, well, if you're not nice enough to us, well, we have other places to look at. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm just saying that this, this is an extremely difficult game. Well, that's what politics is all about, always. <laughs> but, but it is particularly difficult in this case. Um, and, 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 and one last word about the, the, the Serbian-Russian relationship. Um, I mean, let's not deceive ourselves. It has been, it, it is based on uh, the, 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 uh, the claim of a particular cultural, linguistic, religious, uh, and, and, and generally historical brotherhood and, and a close relationship. But 1999, NATO, bombardment, Kosovo, you know, you go to Belgrade today, the, the, only, the only places that are still in ruins are the buildings that have been bombed by, by NATO in 99. And listen, I'm not condemning this. I'm just saying this, the, the, the anti-Western bias that was fueled and of course uh, instrumentalized by, um, uh, by the, the, the rulers in Serbia at the time. But these feelings play a huge role in the Serbia-Russia relationship. And, you know, we, we need to at least take note of this and, and, and understand it 
uh, and I'm, I'm not saying NATO had, uh, had any other choice. Vuk, you may disagree. I fully respect that. But I don't, I don't think it was wrong what happened. I ju I'm just saying that this is the factor, the factor, that makes the Serb case very special among the six and, uh, 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 and, and, and reinforces this uh, historical cultural uh, axis with Russia. Let me just remind you before getting back to Mr. Yeremich, we had Warsaw Pact for over 60 years. And uh, well, tradition is not always the best, uh, the, the, the best argument, I guess. Well, obviously, I would, uh, I would, I would disagree with, uh, with Roland on, uh, on aspects of 1999 and the necessity of a military intervention in the way that it has been conducted, but that's probably for another, for another occasion. Um, this is strong anti-Western bias. Uh, in Serbia right now, it's being perpetuated uh, most uh, feverishly by media who are under full control of the Serbian government. Uh, and especially the tabloid, the newspapers, and, uh, and also television stations with a national frequency that uh, are heavily subsidized uh, by the Serbian government. Uh, what is a little bit more worrying trend when it comes to public perception and public opinion is, uh, is currently the, the public perception and the public opinion of the European Union, uh, which uh, is right now at, uh, at the historic minimum. And if you look at the numbers, if you look at the polls, it keeps going down. And, uh, and this is what worries me as somebody who really wants to see uh, Serbia and the rest of the Western Balkans uh, uh, function like a European Union member state, regardless of when it becomes feasible and doable, uh, the accession itself. That worries me a lot. And uh, with all uh, uh, sympathy and understanding for the complexities that are at the table of the European decision makers uh, that Ron had uh, had referred to several times, very eloquently so, and very convincingly so during today's uh, conversation. Uh, this continual uh, worry about what will happen if the authoritarians are pushed, are penalized, are sanctioned, if you will, uh, whether or not this is going to cause uh, them trying to run into the embrace of, uh, of other actors, Again, I respect and I understand this, but the result is that the enthusiasm and the support for the European accession steadily declines uh, as we proceed with this balancing act. I'm not saying that, uh, of course, I would love that this balancing act uh, changes and uh, uh, transforms into something more decisive and uh, more deterministic when it comes to the, uh, to the, value, uh, to the value judgment uh, on behalf of the European uh, uh, leaders with regard to the authoritarians in the Western Balkans. I'd love it to happen, uh, but uh, I ask especially the, the brains of, uh, of Europe, like, uh, like the Martin Center, to, to think uh, whether this trend of this the declining trend of support for European integration in the Western Balkans, and especially in Serbia, uh, has to do something uh, with this continual balancing act itself. Okay, thank you very much. Um, as I'm trying always to be tight in time and uh, precise when it comes to where we end, and I know that uh, our dear participants, uh, they have many other um, tasks for today. Uh, I want you to you know, I, I know for, unfortunately I have to stop you right here and now in this discussion. And uh, I'm very happy actually that we addressed many issues that were concerning the uh, the security uh, of uh, of the European Union of the Western Balkans region, and that we actually got engaged in the discussion because I could clearly see that you were both discussing with with each other. And I know that there are still questions waiting in the chat box. Um, I guess Daria could actually uh, copy paste them somewhere and probably send to our, uh, to, to our uh, speakers. So you guys, the participants know that uh, we care about uh, 
your opinions, your questions to our to, to, to our friends who are uh, being engaged right now as, as speakers. It was an enormous pleasure to see you virtually today. And uh, it is not only about you speakers, but also about you young leaders from the Western Balkans. Uh, please enjoy the rest of your weekend. Um, wherever you are, lock down uh, or free to grab the second coffee somewhere outside. Stay safe, stay strong, and stay interested in the uh, future of European security and the, in the European Union. Thank you very much. Ciao. Yes, thank you, Bart. I'll make sure that the questions do not uh, get lost, the questions from the chat. Um, so um, I would like to take everyone for uh, the fruitful, fruitful discussion. Big thank you especially to our experts for their exchange and uh, to Bart for keeping things in order. We will take a break now and we will be back at 12.30 for our first um, e-workshop on institutions and decision-making processes with Professor Pisarska this time. So thank you and I will see you soon.